Aloha. Welcome to this week's Moving Hawaii Forward. I'm your host, Tim Apicella. In the next week or so, in Waikiki and downtown residents will soon see a thousand new Beaky bikes stationed on our sidewalks and streets. Bike Share Hawaii is a nonprofit company that has brought this new program to Honolulu. A couple months ago, we had Lori McCarney, CEO of Bike Share Hawaii, onto this show to describe the program in detail and those benefits the Bike Share program will bring to Waikiki. However, since that visit, there have been a couple of issues raised in the news that prompted me to revisit the Bike Share program. One issue is the rental rate for bikes that local residents and tourists will pay if they wish to ride and take advantage of this new program, which is partially funded by the City of Honolulu. Our today's guest, Wyatt Gordon, German Chancellor Fellow and Urban Planner, recently wrote an opinion editorial in the Honolulu Civil Beat News, which focused attention on why should the bike rental rate be higher here in Honolulu than elsewhere in the bike share, where Bike Share Hawaii has other operations in the USA. I suppose given yesterday's Newsweek article that uh, rated Hawaii the most expensive state to live in for the seventh year in a row and the looming ugly debate about the rail project and the taxes needed to pay for it and other pending taxes proposals that uh, really highlight the issue of the cost of living here in Hawaii, these articles seem to be in the news uh, almost every day. So perhaps it is a good time to look at the pricing of this new bike share program and we're going to do that. We're going to get to the bottom of this. So. Uh, Wyatt, thank you for coming on our show this 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 morning, and I uh, look forward to a, a healthy discussion about Beaky and Bike Share Hawaii and and the pricing structure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, um, your article was uh, titled um, "Honolulu Residents Get a Raw Deal with Bike Share." That's a pretty bold pretty bold title. So well, let's talk about your editorial and kind of some of the main points that you um, that you raised in that op-ed opinion. So I chose a really bold title because the pricing system that's been put forward I find to be extremely bold to say the least. This is a completely unprecedented type of model. They've never done pay as you go where you buy blocks of minutes. So they're trying out something new which I totally respect. But what I don't find acceptable is that they've left out options for residents, for kamaaina, and for low income individuals which were explicitly recommended in the pricing study that was released by the Department of Planning and permitting. Mm -hmm. So, um, Bike Share Hawaii is a nonprofit organization. They had some assistance from the Department of Health and I believe the City County of Honolulu in the form of grant dollars. Correct. They received $1 million each from the State Department of Health and the City and County of Honolulu. Okay. Were the, the requirements of those grants, um, were they designed to address any specific uh, criteria regarding pricing for residents or low income? As far as I know that there were no strings attached to the money in terms mm -hmm. of what the pricing should be for the residents, which I think is a real oversight from the people who gave out the grant. Because if I recall your article, it was, there was an, you implied that because we're getting public tax dollars to bring Beaky Bikes to Honolulu, that maybe there should have been some implication that a pricing structure would be beneficial for local residents. Well, I think the expectation of residents here is that if they're going to spend $2 million of their tax money towards something, that they should get something out of it. And mm -hmm. I think that's an expectation that goes unstated. Um, so for them to put out these prices that expect people to pay $180 to $300 a year just to use their bikes, I find that to be pretty outrageous. Okay. One thing that your uh, article did highlight was the fact that their annual price, which there is no annual price mm -hmm. for this new Beaky bike system. It was a monthly uh, way, uh, a pricing structure of $15, and Correct. you just took that by 12 months and you came up with $180. Correct, because the um, pricing studies that were released by the Department of Planning and Permitting, which was actually commissioned from Nelson Nygaard, a very reputable planning firm, and the study that came out of the University of Hawaii Manoa, Department of Urban and Regional Planning, both suggested an annual pass set at $75. Mm -hmm. They, however, ignored these recommendations and went forward with only a monthly pass. So the best value for locals, if you want to use this bike share system year round, is to buy 12 monthly passes at $15 a pop. That makes $180 a year to use this system, right. minimum. If you want to get the 60 minute ride version instead of 30 minutes, then you have to pay a full three hundred dollars a year to use bike share. Right now, that was very clear in your your op-ed. Now, um, 
you compared that to San Francisco, Boston, Washington, D.C., which for a one-year type of annual pass, they're about $90. Yeah, the average for bike share annual membership rates on the mainland is $85. Mm -hmm. A little bit higher, a little bit less, but that's the average. Yeah. That's a full $95 more expensive than our best option here in Honolulu. Correct. And so in fairness, um, I don't have Lori McCartney here at this table with you. Um, I thought about it, but I did reach out. I would have been open to it. Yeah, I, I, good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I have no problem with bike share. I'm not a bike share hater. I really love this system, mm -hmm. and I actually volunteered with bike share for nine months doing community outreach and engagement. So I really want this system to succeed, but I think the problem is, is when you do something the wrong way here in Hawaii especially, people will never forget it. And if you shut locals out, right at your launch and you don't offer an annual pass, you don't offer anything to Kama'aina, you don't offer anything to low-income people, that's what people are going to remember years into the future and they're just creating bad will for themselves. Yeah. Well, I, d I don't hear have her here at this table, but she did actually respond to this morning a publication in Honolulu Civil Beat kind of responding to your editorial. Mm -hmm. So we have dueling editorials going on here. And, and, and she does make one point that um, did make sense to me. and. And that was that in, the, in these markets, be it San Francisco, Boston, YDC, they have, they have a winner. And here in you know, Honolulu, mm -hmm. our winner is very minimal. So her point was that you know, we have operational costs for a 12-month period versus an operational cost that maybe be seven months in some of these other states where there's a, a, a real winter. So therefore, the overhead is greater here. Therefore, that you know the, the fair recovery revenue needs to be higher mm -hmm. to cover a 12-month uh, period of time. Well, you have to consider that's a completely invalid argument because, yes, they'd only have to pay for operations maybe nine months out of the year, which isn't even true. I used to live in D.C. when Capital Bike Share launched, and people bike throughout the winter. It's mm -hmm. just part of the life on the mainland that you live through winter. And on the other hand, so yes, you do have to pay for the operations 12 months out of the year, but you're also bringing in revenue 12 months out of the year. So they have the advantage of being one of, likely to be one of the most profitable systems in the country exactly because they can operate 12 months of the year, unlike a lot of other systems where they do see ridership decrease in the winter. So their argument that, oh, we have to pay for operations year-round, you're also making money year-round, so this is no excuse. Mm -hmm. Not to the degree, though, um, in some of these other cities to where here in Hawaii, well, you know, they'll be, be able to capture revenue because we have better weather. Mm -hmm. And other, you know, other things that were cited uh, that makes Honolulu a good market is that the terrain is flat. Yeah, actually, uh, um, uh, McCartney, CEO Lori McCartney, um, she actually boasted about that. She said, quote, unlike other cities, we have all five factors that make for a successful bike share system. Good weather, flat terrain, urban density, government support, and lots of tourists. And that was in a Hawaii Business Magazine interview from this past January. So in this past January, she's boasting about how this is, has all of the best factors to be one of the most profitable systems in the world. But then she feels like it's unreasonable to give locals a fair deal. So you just don't think locals are going to use this? You just think that the pricing is too high and that they're not going to use it and this this bike system here that's being introduced this week mm -hmm. is, in your words, the most expensive in the country or in the world. Yeah, it is. There's no other bike share system in the world that's more expensive than this one for an annual usage. Okay. Um, I don't see how locals are going to be able to afford that because if you think it's $180 a year, well, I could go to Walmart and buy a brand new bike for $100, which is almost half the price of what they're introducing just to rent a bike. So... I don't see how that's really affordable, especially considering that this isn't an either or. I've heard a lot of people trying to compare this to a bus pass, which is $60 a month, but that's really a false argument because we're going to want people to use bike share um, in conjunction with the bus. So say you live out on the west side or up in Mililani and you catch the bus to town, but you're still eight blocks away from where you want to be for your job. We want people to get off the bus and hop on a bike. We want it to be convenient, we want it to be easy, but that means that people are going to have to afford both a bus pass, which rates are going up, and now a bike share pass. So, a so it's actually compounding the problem of affordable transportation for locals. Where I see the benefit of bike of Beaky is 
what you just pointed out is a connectivity issue. Mm -hmm. And particularly once rail is here and you have a, a station, but you're still six blocks away from work or even long, you know, further than yeah. that, um, this would be an ideal situation to just hop on a bike. And, but um, that would be for the commuter that is using it full time mm -hmm. every day to go to work. And I'm not sure to what extent Viki is addressing the everyday commuter. I mean, that is certainly a market segment that they, they're trying to address. Mm -hmm. um, the other market that they're trying to de address is people who use it periodically. And that could still be a commuter. Um, they're just not going to use it all mm -hmm. the time, but you know, once in a while when they want to run an errand during lunch or, or something like that, it might be a, a very good product to use. Yeah, no, uh, I'm all up for experimentation and pricing, and I have no issue with the current pricing system, except that I feel that it lacks options that are affordable for Kama Aina and for low-income okay. people. So there's two ways of looking at revenue and there's two ways of looking at expense. And that one is you keep the existing pricing structure exactly where it is, but to get to your point, do we charge the tourist even a higher mm -hmm. revenue and you know keep the pricing structure right where it is? Or do you take, uh, do you take it in the shorts a little bit and you just reduce the pricing for local residents? Given the fact that they need to be viable and, and self-sustaining mm -hmm. and profitable to keep this program going, wouldn't it make more sense just to increase the price to tourists? Um, so the prices for tourists are already high. Mm -hmm. That is how all bike share models function. The idea typically is that you have daily, weekly, monthly, and annual passes. And the daily, weekly, and monthly passes are priced above where you would expect them to be. So they make a lot of profit off of those very short periods of rental and use. Whereas the annual pass is set at a very low level, so that way it can be subsidized by all of the excess profit generated by the short-term usage of tourists predominantly. Yeah. So basically it's a way to use tourist dollars to subsidize the mobility and the environmentally friendly form of transportation for locals to incorporate into their commute. Right. But that's not what they've done in this system. With this system, they're trying to get both lots of money from tourists, which is understandable and traditional, mm -hmm. but also get lots of money from local people to the point where I think that locals will just simply choose not to ride it, considering all of the other hassles you have to deal with as a biker. In fairness to Bike Share Hawaii, I don't recall um, Lori's comments about what percentage of this program is going to be dedicated to commuters Mm -hmm. versus what percentage of this program is going to be dedicated to tourism. Um, I think in your op-ed you said 70% tourism? Um, yeah, it's generally that's based off of what people have seen in various bike shows across the mainland. It can be anywhere from 70 to 90% of tourists depending on the city and the structure. Okay. Well, so this is going to be predominantly used for locals. Right. I mean for um, tourists, yeah. Probably minimum 70% of all users will be tourists which is an even stronger argument to offer a good deal to the 10 to 30 percent of local people who will be trying to use the system. Yeah. One thing I do know is that when, when cities obtain grants, be it a CMAT grant or a federal um, T21, mm -hmm. Transportation Efficiency Act of 21st Century, that those grants are usually, um, when they, the, uh, the grant proposal goes through, is to address the commute market and trying to reduce congestion from commuters, not mm -hmm. more as a promotion for tourism. So I guess I'm just wondering if how many trips or cars will be reduced off the streets on a program that may be dedicated more to tourism than to the commuter. But we don't know until this program actually takes effect. Yeah. But it goes to your point a little bit to say, well, if you want commuters you know, to take advantage of this, then the pricing structure needs to be advantageous for, for those commuters. The way that Bike Share was launched and sold actually began with the EPA. And it started with the EPA looking at ways that we could reduce our vehicle miles traveled on the island. DMT, yep. Yeah, so the EPA actually put forward money to get Bike Share started. I think they paid for the organizational study, but don't quote me on that. And um, so it all started about trying to get people to bike more instead of driving cars. But as the nonprofit was formed and they failed to get any private donations, then it became imperative upon the city and the state to put forward money. Right. So what was originally envisioned to be a completely self-sustaining NGO, nonprofit, then had to come to the taxpayer and beg for money 
to keep themselves alive until they could find a private donor. Okay. And then hold that thought. We're running out of time, so we're going to take a commercial break. Okay. I'm Tim Apicello. This is Moving Hawaii Forward. I'm here with uh, Wyatt Gordon, and we'll be right back. Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. We are live here every other Thursday at 4 p.m. and we welcome you to join us here at Sister Power. Aloha and thank you. We all play a role in keeping our community safe. Every day we move in and out of each other's busy lives. It's easy to take for granted all the little moments that make up our every day. Some are good, others not so much. But that's life. It's when something doesn't seem quite right that it's time to pay attention. Because only you know what's not supposed to be in your everyday. So protect your everyday. If you see something suspicious, say something to local authorities. Aloha, I'm Tim Apicella. Welcome back to Moving Hawaii Forward. I'm here with Wyatt Gordon, who uh, recently wrote an article in the Honolulu Civil Beat regarding the Beaky Bike Program, um, which is, uh, is being sponsored by Bike Share Hawaii. And specifically, we're talking about the fare structure. And specifically to that, we're talking about the fare structure of um, what the cost is to local residents. So again, welcome back. Thank you. And you had a graph in your um, mm -hmm. op-ed piece. And I think we want to take a look at that. I want to pull it up. That would be excellent. And uh, here it is. Well, we won't be able to look at it because that one's offline. But you have it right in front of me. I so why don't you go ahead and explain it? Um, so basically what you see here are eight of the top cities with, that have bike share systems on the mainland. Honolulu, New York City, Chicago, Denver, San Francisco, Boston, Washington, D.C., and Minneapolis. And there are two bars for each of them. And one it explains the cost of the price per year for 30-minute unlimited rides. Just to be sure, we're comparing apples to apples. So mm -hmm. all cities offer the same one. And then the other one, the darker bar, is the purchasing power in the metropolitan area. This comes from Forbes in 2014. So what Forbes found was that Honolulu ranks actually 107th out of 113 American cities in terms of purchasing power. So if you look at the graph, you see that not only is Bike Share Hawaii going to be the single most expensive system in the country, if not the world, but it also has the lowest purchasing power based on all of those eight cities. So essentially, Bike Share Hawaii is asking residents who have the least amount of money to put toward this to pay the highest prices in the world. Okay. Um, again, Ms. McCartney's not here, but I'm going to bring up a point that she raised, and that was they did extensive research mm -hmm. um, about the marketplace here in Hawaii, and one of the things that they, they came up with was that um, they're trying to get away from the annual pass system because they feel that those annual pass systems are restrictive and they're not as successful in these other marketplaces on the mainland. And so by, by their research, which they came up with, mm -hmm. they're, they're claiming that <clears throat> that maybe wasn't the, the best pricing structure for Bikes Share Hawaii or the Beaky program. So um, annual passes do lose money, and they lose money by design, because annual passes are designed for the local people who actually live in the city that host the bike share. Because as we've seen over the past week, hosting a bike share system, while beneficial to the city as a whole, doesn't always directly translate into benefits for all residents. So from where we've seen parking stalls disappearing, infringements on sidewalk space, possible ADA compliance issues, and general frustration from the thousands of oblivious bikers we're going to have added to our streets overnight. Basically, it's a way for the bike share system to say, hey, we know that this isn't necessarily the best thing for all individual residents, but for those people who do want to use the system and be part of it, we're going to make it affordable. And that's a very strategic move on bike share systems part because what it's doing is buying them allies. They need allies who are local residents. You're saying that uh, a, a, a discount for uh, local residents is basically a mitigation mm -hmm. from some of these things that, that Beaky may present to It's a way to residents. apologize and make up for all of the frustrations that come with having a large bike share system because we have a lot of tourists. If you just think back to the bike share system in Kailua that was 12 bikes, 
It was a nightmare. People complain about it to this day. And it's going to be like that, but with a thousand bikes in urban Honolulu, in Waikiki, with a lot of one-way streets. And we're going to be dealing with a lot of tourists from other countries that have very different laws regarding bikes and the flow of traffic. It's inevitable that there's going to be an immense amount of frustration. And offering an affordable annual pass is a very effective strategy for a bike share to get buy-in from local residents that might otherwise simply complain or seek to dismantle the system completely. Okay, you re you've made your point very well on that. Um, if I recall that um, this program that um, Bike Share Hawaii was going to place ambassadors out on many of these uh, bike stations, I don't know for what period of time or duration, but mm -hmm. these bike ambassadors are going to be there to kind of help tourists get by the fact that they don't know the rules of the road here in mm -hmm. Hawaii and, you know, and try to educate them about um, biking courtesy, I guess, if you will. Um, one point you made that I do want to talk about before mm -hmm. the show ends, and that is the elimination of parking spaces that I'm already hearing about on, you know, from mm -hmm. my neighborhood is some of these spaces are disappearing. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, okay, so your point is that there should just be a discount because uh, one, if you want to encourage the commute market, then address the commute market. But two is a mitigation for the inconveniences that local residents in the downtown core in Waikiki are going to have to experience. Three local tax dollars, two million worth, went into keeping the system alive when no private entity would pay for it before the private company of PBSC Urban Solutions swooped in and installed this new bike share system. And four, because they really need local allies, this could become a political fight. And if they don't treat locals right, then locals could easily agitate for a mandatory helmet law, which would effectively kill the system kill the program. as it just it happened in Seattle. Seattle. Program. Exactly. It, it Seattle program so if they don't treat local <laughs> people right, then local people are going to look for ways to end bike share in their city. So it's really just in their best interest to offer local people a good deal so that locals are also benefiting from the system and support the system's existence. So if you had your, your way or if you had your dreams come true on this, what pricing structure would you, um, would you feel would be uh, a win-win? I feel that they must introduce an annual pass. The studies from UH Hawaii Manoa and from the Department of Planning and Permitting suggest $75 right. for that annual pass. Maybe that's negotiable. Maybe that's where we come to a compromise and set something higher. There are a couple cities on the mainland that have raised their annual pass prices, but only to $85 or $99, not to $180. Yeah. Well, you've just previously said that an annual pass is a losing proposition. It's and always it's going not. to be a losing proposition. So if I'm trying to make a program viable and viable for the future, why would I implement a, a, a pass structure or a pricing structure that is going to lose money for the for the market for, for our operation? Um, it's exactly the same way that they offer affordable passes to low income residents. Mm -hmm. um, for example, Boston, New York City, the Bay Area, and Chicago all offer five dollar annual passes to people who are below the poverty line. And in Washington, D.C., they give it out for free. Mm -hmm. That's not to make money, but a bike share system's sole purpose isn't to make money. This is a nonprofit that's supposed to have a heart, and it's supposed to care about the community. It took all of this money, $2 million, from the public, so it should care about the public. And yes, they'll lose money on adding a $75 annual pass, adding $5 low-income pass options, but that's what it means to be a part of this place, to be a part of the community and to care for those around you. You're not just out to make money. You have to actually try and do something beneficial. And that's why they got all the grants from the city and the state to make an impact on residents' lives and to give real benefits. Well, they are going to make money. I mean, the projection for the first year is 1.2 million. If and I'm for the second year, it's 2.6 million. Um, so, that revenue is going to go towards expanding and investing in the system, as Lori McCarney continually repeats. But it also has to go back paying for the loan for the bikes that were purchased with PBSC's money, the private company. And a portion of that revenue is going to go to PBSC Urban Solutions, or else why would they spend so much money as a private company to come in and manage the system for our nonprofit? Okay, your point's well made. 
I want to talk about the, the issue that I hear residents talking about is the elimination of some parking spaces. And there's a, I'm going to run through the math very quickly, but there's a thousand bikes and each station holds 15 bikes. So if you take a thousand, you divide it by 15 bikes, you come up with about 67 stations. And they've actually share. just installed 87. Okay. Um, because there are going to be more stalls than there are bikes. So when you show up to any given station, there should be extra stalls available for you to I dock. See. Well, I didn't do the math on 87. So there I are 87. 67, so no, no, I saw 87 in the news this okay. morning. About, eight, about a third of all stations will or have already mm -hmm. removed parking stalls. So based on 67, you take a third of that and you're basically looking at about 44. If you take oh, 87, and then you times that by two, because two two mm -hmm. parking stalls are being removed, you've got about 44, 46 stalls removed from these new stations. Well, if you take Is that a lot, if you, you take the number 87, okay, roughly 90, we divide by three, so we have 30 stations that are using parking. Multiply it by two, so we actually have 60 parking stalls that have disappeared yeah. for bike share. I personally know and understand the outrage. I live in Mo'ili'ili. Street parking is extremely hard between all of the abandoned vehicles and commercial vehicles that park in our area. I understand the frustration. That's part of why I choose to bike for a lot of my transportation. But that doesn't take away from the fact that they're taking away what were publicly available stalls and turning them into more of commercial enterprises. Because if these private um, if these bike share system isn't priced for locals to use, then locals have essentially lost their parking stalls and gained a tourist amenity in their place. So that's not really a good deal for local people. Yeah, I think if there's a criticism that might come out a little bit louder, and that it won't necessarily be over your pricing structure, as you, you got op-ed on, I mm. think it's going to be the loss of parking spaces because people notice that right away. They already know how tight these neighborhoods are. Yeah. I think that's where, in fact, on Capulani Park, there was a discussion about public lands. The trust. And, but, you know, the city has the right-of-ways there. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they, they have right-of-ways, so it's up to them to increase parking charges if they wish or, you know, remove parking if they wish. So I, I don't know if the public land argument works or wins the day, but when you I talk did about see the attorney generals investigating that because the Capulani Trust explicitly states that there can't be any commercial enterprises. And one interpretation is that bike share is a commercial enterprise based on these profit numbers. So okay. it's, it's going to be investigated by the state attorney I'm general. going to follow up with the city representative, the, the, the public information officer, about that point. And I just didn't have a chance to do mm -hmm. it before the show. But um, yeah, that needs to be kind of looked at. And hopefully, I'm going to tell you where I'm coming from on this. Mm -hmm. I hope this program succeeds. Um, I do I, too. I spent 18 years of my life trying to reduce traffic. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I, I would like to see the commuter market take advantage of this program. And it's great that tourists take advantage of it. I just don't know how many trips or how many cars we're taking off the road exactly. from tourists. And my hope is that more residents, local residents, take advantage of the program and, and we get rid of more cars so that, you know, yeah. we have less congestion. I really want this system to succeed. I spent nine months volunteering for them, completely unpaid as an intern working on issues of community engagement and outreach. So my focus is on the community. What benefit is this system going to bring to the community? And the way I see it priced now, I don't see local people having the opportunity to use this and enjoy any of those benefits to mobility or public health. So we've really just spent these $2 million for a tourist bike system. Okay. Well, I'm glad you brought your points up. I may ask Lori McCarney Please to come do. back again. I'd love to hear her responses. And um, thank you for taking your time to, yeah. to join us. I'm Tim Apicella. This is Moving Hawaii Forward. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Aloha.